Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, also, thanks for having us here uh, and let us talk uh, on behalf of Mock and on behalf of the things that we work on a daily basis, um, which in Matt's um, case is abuse handling, in my case is abuse handling. Uh, I just had to ask Matt how long he's uh, been in an abuse desk, and he told me he's eight years, so he's working eight years in, in an abuse desk. I'm in the abuse industry since 2002, so uh, working at uh, Unity Media, a huge German ISP, a while ago and started building a, an abuse desk. So we both know how it feels when you have this problem in front of you and you want to start working in an abuse desk because we did exactly the same. We started these things up and we were we had no clue. There was no documentation. There was no idea on how you have to handle these things. So it was kind of learning and uh, on the job more or less. Uh, and we made a lot of mistakes uh, we wouldn't do again, uh, but we did also a lot of good stuff, otherwise we wouldn't be there for eight years and uh, even longer. Um, so and that's exactly the intent of this, um, this whole um, um, training session, to give you a little bit of our experience um, uh, on how, how to start working uh, an abuse desk. So I'm, I'm, I'm a very positive person usually. So that's why I'm saying abuse handling a perfect world. How would a perfect world look like if everybody in the world uh, would be doing a perfect job in abuse handling? There was an interesting, uh, an interesting um, paper written in 2002 by a, a professor at the Technical University in Delft in the Netherlands. His name is uh, Michel van Aden. Um, and he wrote a paper which more or less stated if the top 50 ISPs and hosting companies in the world would solve their problems from an abuse perspective back in 2002 that would have solved a huge amount of problems in the cyber in cybersecurity so we would not be ending up uh, maybe with the ddos attacks or maybe ransomware would have never come up but that was 2002 the internet got larger we have more and more companies out there um, so we have more and more players that need ta to take care about abuse handling um, and that's exactly what, what we're pushing and what we're uh, looking forward to work with people uh, in different industries uh, to go that uh, direction. So to understand abuse, there's two things which is mostly or which mostly are, are mixed up is the inbound and the outbound part. So the inbound part is more or less that you guys can protect your users from the internet, which is a classic spam filter, which is a classic firewall, a classic IDS system which is a classic uh, antivirus product, which means if some of your users, you, you, wanna, or you wanna try to hide the content that should not be seen by your user from your users. That's the typical inbound part. When we're talking about outbound, it's the other way around. And outbound is exactly what abuse means. It means that you're protecting the internet from your own users. But what, how does that really look like? If you're looking at the threat, um, at a threat um, timeline, Usually, uh, a new threat comes up. We have seen uh, WannaCry uh, uh, one and a half, two weeks ago. I think everybody has heard about that. And we have usually, when we're looking at new threats, there's always new threats out there. Um, it's, there's never a point in time when no new threats have been evolved, when no new threats have been coming up. What the security industry does today is they're looking at these new threats and they make them known and then they put them into their um, virus products and antivirus products into their firewalls um, so um, your users will be safe from an inbound perspective again. But what happens between the time between we know and we see a new threat and the threat is known and we can do something? So the example with WordPress is, is a really, really good example because we know that there's a security hole, but the developers of WordPress have to fix it, and then all the users have to roll it out. And even if you have rolled it out, maybe you have already been compromised. So fixing the, the issue at that point is too late. So the, industry, the, the security industry over the last decades was really focusing on making sure that the user is not getting in trouble, but Abuse handling is exactly what are we going to do with the compromised host that we couldn't save because we were not fast enough to make a, a new threat, a known threat, and fix it and solve these things. So abuse desks are exactly um, um, trying to get the amount of, or to, to, to lower the time frame that these, uh, that these things can, uh, can happen. So the number one priority in an abuse desk is always and will always be speed. And that's really, really simple to explain. If a bad guy has to, whatever, take 15 minutes, 20 minutes to open up a compromised WordPress account, 
and to you know, open it up and upload a phishing site or start spamming over this machine. Um, the moment he pulls the trigger, he's going to be earning money with it. So they're making this because they earn money with it. If we are on the abuse task side, are faster in pulling the plug or solving the problem, mitigating, remediating, taking away the channels that the bad guy uses, it's not being interesting for the bad guy anymore. So at this time, in, or at the moment, we have, in, in, in certain cases, uh, some, some things never get fixed. So the bad guys can use this infrastructure forever. They can earn money with it forever. And that's exactly what they do. So if we want to solve the problem, and if you within your networks want to solve the problem of being blacklisted, on having a bad reputation, on having maybe uh, huge amounts of support calls, it's all about speed. Speed has another, uh, another point that is really, really interesting, and that's something that I have seen out of experience because uh, I'm um, uh, at the company Abusix. We're working with a lot of uh, companies and helping them and work with them on how to establish an abuse desk and how to make it as efficient as possible. The interesting thing is the better and the faster you get, the less interesting your network gets for the bad guys because there's no interest for them to get in. So. If you see a huge amount of volume coming in your abuse mailbox, the moment you start getting better and the moment you start getting faster in what you do, the less complaints you will see. And it's not only because you solve problems, it's also you will not see a, uh, uh, the same amount of new compromises of new uh, attacks on different types of subscribers or uh, customers within your networks. The second one is sustainability. I think that's also clear. If you, if you want to fix something with a customer, you want to fix it once and for all for a, this explicit problem. The customer might come up five weeks later because he installed another WordPress plugin, which is still a security or still has a security problem, and he will be back and you will have to handle him uh, as well. But you want to make sure that you have to has, uh, have less follow-ups with your customer because that saves your company money and it saves your nerves if you don't have to be in that much contact with the customers over and over again. And this is especially a big thing when you start working on abuse desk and you have, let's say, a thousand or two thousand people or end customers that you have to handle. Then you want to make sure that you don't have to spend a lot of time on them and you want to make sure that you do it right at the very first time. The number three is something that's a little bit further down the road. You want to reach more or less completeness. So the, the, the goal, and that's why I'm saying a perfect world, um, the completeness of cleaning your network and making sure that everything in your network is 100% clean. I know we're not, never going to get there. It's really, really hard to, to, to get there um, or never possible. But you want to at least aim for that. So if you can solve as much problem, and even if you're getting over to 80, 85%, maybe 90%, that's already, I think you're already in the top 10 or top, top 50 companies in the world. So that's more or less the, the theory of abuse handling as a, as a very, a, on a very high level. Be fast, do it only once, don't do it uh, several times to solve a customer and be as complete as possible. So, but the question is always, now you're standing there and saying, yeah, this sounds all good, but how do I start with it? What, is this, what does the process look like um, from an abuse handling perspective, and what can I do, and what can I start doing um, um, in my own company when I get back home from LACNIC? So we put together uh, a few lessons learned that we have seen over time, and I want to just go through it. You, some of these things you have heard already uh, in the presentation of Matt earlier, but one of the things is really be pragmatic. Uh, abuse handling is not a science project. It's something that you have to work things down. You have a queue and you need to work it. It's not like that you can figure out a technical, super technical solution that maybe fixes all the things at the same time and everything is being good. That might happen for some of the things if you can roll out updates and stuff will be automatically fixed. But be pragmatic, it's a pragmatic job that you need to do. Uh, data is king. So the more data you have, the easier it is for you to uh, detect compromised hosts within your network or problems that are uh, existing in your network. We usually, when we're going to a new customer, we usually, uh, and the customer says, yeah, we usually don't have a problem, we don't see enough. That only means that you don't have enough data. So there's no network out there which is absolutely 100% clean and 100% good. 
So you need to subscribe to all the data sources that are out there. Um, there's a few blog posts uh, on the internet. Just look for abuse data sources. Um, you know, feedback loops you can have, the shadow server reports, there's spam cops out there, um, there's trap networks, paid and uh, freely available uh, net trap networks, where you can more or less subscribe to, uh, with your ISN or with your net uh, IP addresses and SID ranges to, and you will receive reports about what's really going wrong within your network. So the first step if you start um, is really, this is a really, really important one. Good tooling create, creates actionable knowledge. It was interesting when Matt earlier asked um, somebody to more or less yell the biggest problem uh, that he thinks that he has within his company, the usual answer always is spam. But we figured out over the, over the years when we walk, work with um, companies that after you have good tooling in place and you can analyze all the data that's coming in and you get a really a good overview of what how much stuff comes really in. Spam never is number one. So spam is always in the perception of, yeah, we have blacklisting problems, we have these problems, we have those problems, and they are all related to spam. But at the end of the day, they're not always related to spam. Because a, spam, a spamming customer, it depends on, is he spamming on purpose because he's a bad actor or because he bought a bad list? Or is he just compromised? But if he's compromised, it's not only spam that's happening there. So usually if you have a bot within your network, spam is only one out of maybe a hundred things that they do. They are participating in DDoS attacks, they're um, hosting phishing websites. A few years ago they did FastFlux DNS, which is, uh, which is coming up again in the, in the last few months again uh, a little bit. So what you need is you need a good tooling to analyze all the data to figure out what is really the problem within my network. What's the point? And what do I have to, uh, what do I have to, uh, to work on? And that's exactly number, number three, is know your challenge. You can't fight something that you don't know. You might fight at the complete wrong end and you will never get better just because you don't know where the real problem sits. And when we're talking about, um, just to, to give you a relation, we're talking about uh, companies here um, where this is really, really getting important. Um, they receive about 200,000 emails or email abuse reports per day on their abuse mailbox. So if you receive that amount of, of data, or even if it's less, you need to know where the problem really is. One of the other points is, and this is exactly what Matt was, uh, was talking about, implement and, and live a process. So the, the, the point is, if you're in your company, you need to make everybody aware that abuse and abuse handling and compromise toast is nothing that you want to have in, in your network. And that's already something that's helping when you, when you do the a exercise with the AOP. Because that always starts kind of this process of getting people on your side, pulling people into this, uh, this topic. And you need to under make the product managers understand that a fake customer, which credit card bounces after this, uh, the, the, the second try or the third try, is not a customer. So I was working at one on one a long time ago, and we were always in a fight between um, 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 product managers and the abuse desk because the product manager were measured by new signups and we were more or less closing down 50% of them. So they were always um, you know, fighting with us and saying, so why are you closing them down? Because we saw that 50% no, that of the customers that signed up newly never paid, and so the problem was you, know, you don't want to have these type of customers within your network, and this is something that you need to establish to make understand to your product manager, to your legal uh, counsel, to everybody that's in the company that works with you, that this is an important point and that this is something that you need to pull into the same direction. So number five, automate, automate, automate. That is something that's really, that really uh, is important for companies that have huge abuse tasks and huge amounts of data. If you're a small um, ISP or a small hosting company, uh, you know, receiving 100 reports per day and that's really all that you receive, there's no need for automation. And there's tools out there, and I will come to that later, that are, ex that are made for exactly these sizes. And there's also tools out there which are uh, built for, for, for the really um, big, uh, for big ISPs and big, um, um, with big data volumes. Automation is, automation is important for one reason. Um, or even for a small one, it could be interesting. Um, another anecdote from my time at One on One, um, we, had, we were working until five o'clock on Fridays and more or less everybody went home on Friday, 5 o'clock. We were coming into the office on Monday morning, 8 o'clock, and we saw that the spammers started at 6 o'clock on Friday. 
So they pulled the trigger, 6 o'clock Friday. They knew exactly nobody's working over the weekend. So they had a Friday afternoon, a Saturday, a Sunday, and a, and a Monday morning. And we came back to the office on Monday morning, and we were seeing these huge amounts of complaints and huge amounts of blacklistings that came in over the weekend. This is something that you want to automate, if you can automate it. So that means if you can automate it, you have at least partly of your abuse desk, you have 24-7, 365 coverage, um, which makes it really hard for the bad guys or harder for the bad guys to figure out a spot where they, you know, where they can play without being disturbed. Number, the, the next one, iterate, grow, uh, grow based on growing information and knowledge. You will, not, you will not be able to get the processes that you do right the first time. This is not going to happen. This is the same with software. You will not get the software 100% exactly the way you want in the first try. You have to iterate. You have to look which processes are going well, which processes are not going well, which processes can we adjust. Do we need to adjust, um, do we need to adjust for example, only templates that we send to customers so they can, uh, they can fix the problem or they, um, they don't understand how to fix the problem? So there's a lot of things that you can iterate through and that you can, uh, that you can work uh, on this and make the processes, even if they're manual, better and better over time, which gives you more, uh, a better handle on, on, on these things. Pull other departments into your process, fraud, billing, vetting. That's a really, really big one. And that's a really, really big one where we see a lot of companies that we work with um, getting budget um, because of working with other companies. So another example, US company, you sign up uh, for a virtual private service, you put in your credit card, um, they charge your credit card immediately, uh, and for every of the, of the signups, um, the credit card bounces. So your company is paying chargeback. Uh, for the credit card company, which is usually between $20 and $30 per users. If you have 15,000 users signing up every day and you have to pay $30 for fake users that come in, uh, that's a lot of money that you can save. So what they did is more or less they moved the credit card billing down the road for seven days. And they waited for seven days. Do we see something coming in in the abuse desk? Do we have information about these people setting up these servers and doing something weird? If yes, throw them out terminate immediately uh, and don't even, uh, don't even bother um, I'm charging them their credit card because that will save you a lot of money from a perspective of, of chargeback quotes. The same is, you know, the vetting, uh, the, the, the vetting um, 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 getting, getting customers on site is kind of the same or fra uh, fraudulent signups. So some people, some companies have fraud, uh, fraud detection tools, but you can use those fraud detection tools together with abuse. And if you see it smells like fraud and there's complaints coming in, that gives you a better handle on what you want to do with this customer and how you want to react to it. So and that goes back to data is king. The more data, not only from external sources you have, also from internal sources. And not only from sources within billing and within the, the typical you know, legal and, uh, and these departments or fraud departments, but also from a perspective of, um, of technical data from your technical departments. Another story about that um, hosting, not hosting company, uh, cable provider, um, they had a huge problem um, and they had to spend every month hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep their DNS infrastructure up and running. The problem was that they had so many uh, compromised hosts within their subscriber base that they were trying to do DDoS attacks over the, um, the DNS infrastructure of their ISP. And the ISP guys at the DNS, uh, on the DNS level, they were fighting to keep the DNS up and running, but the abuse desk was not existing. They solved their abuse problem on one hand, and the DNS guys had a, had a nice life because they didn't have the problems anymore and the loads on the DNS servers were going down. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, interactions that you can have within your company, and that's a, re a really important thing that also creates this outreach and this mindset of we need to do something against abuse that I was talking earlier on. Um, look over the fence, what the industry does. I think I don't have to tell you that. That's why you're here. Uh, you want to you wanna see what other people do. You want to talk to other people and, uh, and exchange that. So I think uh, we covered that. And the last one, which is really an, an important information as well, uh, you need to provide information to other ISPs and hosting companies. So data is king. You want to have data from others about attacks from your network towards their network and towards their subscribers. So be fair and share back data with uh, other people. Um, Mog uh, is coming out with a few documents, hopefully in the next few months, um, a best practice paper about how you can report abusive behavior. Um, we're working on a standardized email format, or not email format, on a standardized format at the moment, moment called XARF um, that will standardize the parsing process for an abuse desk uh, uh, to a huge amount. 
and we think uh, that, that, that that's going to drive um, um, the data sharing part uh, in the industry even more. Any questions so far? Good, and let's go on. So how does a process, how does an abuse handling process overall look like? Um, all, this, all the next slides or the next slides are also based on a best practice paper that we're working on at Mock at the moment. Um, we will hopefully uh, release the, uh, uh, the, the best practice document for discussion on the Mock mailing list and maybe also another mailing list uh, um, uh, before uh, Mock in June uh, in Lisbon. So in the next two weeks, three weeks maybe. So the process looks pretty simple. You have inbound, uh, that might be your abuse mailbox, that might be an API where your networking guys uh, push data in, that might be uh, APIs, um, or that might be web forms, that might be all types of details and information and systems that can collect information that can help you detect abusive behavior. Um, the second one is processing. You need to process all this data, which is, it sounds easy to process all this data, but it's actually not that easy. Um, the third one is more or less handling, which is the process that Matt was talking before. How do I handle this whole thing? How do I build the process? How do I get the process done? And the last one is the remediation mitigation part, which is how do I inter interact with my customers? The interesting thing about that is, and this is one of my strong beliefs about security, I don't, I don't believe in proactive security because proactive security does, in my opinion, not exist. I can't handle something that I not know. And the bad guys are clever enough to come up with stuff that is not being handled by stuff that we already have. So it's, it's not about reactive versus proactive in this case. It's about the speed and how fast you, you get. So if we're, looking at the, if we're looking at the variations of inbound data, as I already mentioned, we have abuse ad addresses. Um, we see, meanwhile, um, about 3,200 different email formats being sent around by different organizations all over the world. So there's the standard, the standard formats like ARF, like XRF, like ACNS, like IODEF, and all the names that they have and all the abbreviations they have. Um, but there's also you know, a lot of universities, a lot of private people that send you know, a spam message and say, hey, I received that spam message, I don't want to have that. And you want to, if you can, you want to handle that. In some cases, it's just not possible because you don't have all the data in. And this is exactly what you need to look at from, a, from, a, from, a, from an inbound perspective and going into the processing perspective. Um, I think we can jump over that uh, pretty fast because Matt was already mentioning some of them. Um, you know, child exploitation, offensive content are the things that you really, that you really want to look at from, uh, from, from a, a perspective of, of handling them fast. Um, the problem mostly is if you have a mailbox full of 100,000 messages or 50,000 messages a day and this is all dropping into your IMAP folder, how do you find these pieces within uh, 50,000 messages? And how many people do you need to parse through it and to work through it and to get it really resolved? We see when we, we, have, we have talked to a few uh, organizations like Thorn. I don't know who's uh, familiar with it. This is the organization Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore um, 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 established a few years ago, which is... Uh, about uh, trafficking, child trafficking, and uh, child exploitation, and they're doing a lot of work in this, and they see that most of the ISPs and hosting companies having a hard time even finding or even, 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 even seeing uh, if they send reports. Uh, they don't even know about these things in the network because they don't have a good view on what's really going on in their network. And we see about 40 to 45 uh, additional report types um, that are kind of mixed together. Uh, one tip from my side, don't try to really uh, make a 100% uh, distinction uh, between these report types. So uh, a spam message can also be a phishing message. So what is it? Is it spam or is it phishing? Um, or spamvertised, as Matt uh, mentioned earlier. Um, spamvertised is a URL that's sent within an, uh, a spam message. But uh, this can also be a, a phishing site or it can be malware site. So don't try to be too, um, too dogmatic about that. Uh, it's all a little bit in a flowing, uh, uh, or a little bit flowing. So, making sense of all the information. As I said, you receive 50,000, uh, 100,000, maybe 10,000, maybe even 1,000 messages per day. So how do you make sense of all that data? You receive 1,000 messages, 45 different types, from maybe 60 different uh, resources with uh, 55 different formats. So how can you more or less go through an, uh, a mailbox and figure out on how this works? 
The first thing that we usually do with customers is uh, a customer and subscriber allocation because that leads to an aggregation. So if I'm an ISP and I have dynamic IP space that I give to my subscribers, I need to have some kind of API where I can ask this IP address, this timestamp, who is the customer behind. If I already do this, I can more or less narrow down the amount of customers that I have to handle depending on, uh, depending on how good my um, uh, allocation process works. But this is the biggest, this is the biggest part, and I will show you a few numbers uh, in a second. So the, the, the aggregation gives you exactly this, com this complete view that you really have to handle. This is your workload. It's not the 10,000 messages a day. It's only the customers that you have to handle. And if you receive 10,000 messages for only five customers, and you have solved these five customers, you will not receive more, 10, 000, more than 10,000 messages again. So that's more or less the logic behind that. And you want to uh, move as much manual handling into, into automation. Um, that's what I already mentioned earlier. So I have, th these are live numbers. Um, so we have one customer which received 22.2 uh, .2 million uh, events. Uh, I think that's over the last 30 days, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the amount of, uh, the amount of um, customers they have to solve is 779, so 780,000 uh, unique customers that they have to solve within their network. Uh, the good thing is about, I didn't put the agenda down there, um, the, the, the gray part, so over half of it, is what they already have resolved and what they already have handled. But it's a huge difference if you have to look into 22, 22 million messages. I can't even remember, I can't, or can't even imagine an IMAP folder or a mail program which is capable of handling that type of, uh, of messages. And we're not talking then about filtering or looking for certain patterns within this. So that's just plain simple impossible. Another, another customer is, uh, in this case, it works even better. They had received over the last 30 days about 10 million uh, events. And in this case, it's about 75,000 customers. So I took numbers that are really, really big. Um, some of you might, uh, might think that they have, or maybe in the, in the same ballpark, um, some of you might uh, know that they are already smaller in this case. But the aggregation part and uh, getting it down to the customer is really, really a huge step that can help uh, a lot. So the handling process um, is exactly prioritizing and decision making. What's, what things do I work first? What are the things that I need to work? Uh, can I split them up? Um, I have a customer, for example, that has a DSL uh, or a cable modem line, and he's also having a few uh, root servers. Um, can I split them out? Can I say, okay, I can have customers that have a problem on the, on the cable modem, and I have customers that have um, 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 problems on their dedicated servers. And the difference is in handling them. How do I handle them? The, the, the cable modem will be completely uh, handled completely differently than the server. I have completely different uh, ways of handling these things, uh, so I need to differentiate that. And these are things that um, technical or uh, good toolings uh, and tools can, can more or less provide that you can build a certain process for every single uh, type of um, complaint or um, um, case you have. And these, is and these are exactly the things if you know and if you come to a point to see what type of problems are within your network and you have a number and you know our dedicated servers are 80% of the problems we have, then it might not be the cable provider part uh, that is spamming. And these are exactly the numbers that will give you more confidence in how you step forward and how you do the job and how you work uh, on, on, on these things. So you can, you know, the prioritization can be done in, in different ways. Um, as Matt already said, uh, it can be phishing versus spam or versus copyright. Some people don't care about copyright, so they don't work it uh, at all. Or do I just look at the, uh, the pure numbers and how many reports do I have? But you can choose whatever. For example, if spam house is really, really important for you, then maybe 55 complaints from AOL and one from spam house uh, will trigger the point that you have to handle it immediately. So, but this is things we can only give a guideline on what the industry overall does, and this is what we do. But you, as uh, within your company, you have to more or less make the differentiation and make the decision what is really important. Um, yes. So, um, divide and conquer is this what, what we call it. So, as I already said, split down things, uh, split it down in copyright, split it down in spam, and handle those in a different way because you need to have different processes uh, in, in this area. Everything else goes into a standard playbook 
or in a standard in a standard group that you work maybe manually and you will never be able to do all, everything automatically but make sure that the amount of stuff that you have to work manually over time goes away or gets as small as possible. So how do we solve these issues? How do we solve these problems? We have more or less four root causes uh, of compromises or of uh, abusive behavior within, uh, within the network. Um, one is a compromised account, customer server, somebody that, or your customer does not even know that his WordPress is, uh, is compromised and he's hosting a phishing website, or he does not even know that his computer at home is part of a botnet and is doing uh, bad things. We have fraud and criminal activity, which is people that I mentioned before signing up for the service, trying to misuse your service as long and as fast as they can, and then if you cancel them, you will never hear anything from them. Um, they will just go away and they will try again. Um, the third one is user behavior. We know all uh, these guys that are sending right before Christmas, sending out a newsletter to all their customers, and nobody knows exactly where they uh, where they received their the list from, or maybe they're sending a Christmas card to people that haven't uh, been in their shop for 15 years. So we all know these guys. This is an educational part. We need to educate the customers and tell the customer, hey, this is something that you did wrong, and you shouldn't do this again. Um, this is just misbehavior or n not, not being aware of, of these things. The fourth is, is a little bit a special one, and I would uh, suggest not going after that one right at the beginning because that's more uh, an advanced part, is vulnerabilities. Um, there's a lot of companies out there and organizations like Shadow Server that uh, scan for vulnerabilities, and if you have time and if you have bandwidth, to work with your customers and, uh, and let them solve uh, vulnerabilities, or you have an automation process in place where you can just send a standardized email out and say, hey, we have seen your uh, Redis server or your MongoDB server on the server that you, uh, that you have with us is open. This is, a, this is how you can fix this. Then go that way. But if you do that in a manual way, you will you don't, don't look at these things. Don't, don't touch them because you will uh, have a lot of time or you will waste a lot of time with things that are not bad at this point. So, of course, always a vulnerability can become a compromise, but focus on the compromises and not on the vulnerabilities. So, the other thing is handling, as I said before, um, um, environment uh, is, is, uh, depends on business or private customer. Uh, you can't shut down a business customer right away without notifying him, but if it's a private customer or if it's even a free user, uh, you can do so. Um, and there's hundreds of thousands of possibilities depending on your environment and depending on what type of company you are and how you can mitigate and remediate it. So um, mitigation um, is what, what we would define as uh, I, I block a port and make the problem not visible anymore. So for example, if somebody has dedicated servers and he's hosting a phishing website, the easiest thing that you can do is go to your firewall, block port 80 and 443, send the customer email and say, hey, you know, everything else is working, your mail is not impacted, nothing else is impacted, but this is what we did just to get rid of the phishing website, so fix your stuff, let us know, and we can open up the ports again, or let him maybe do this um, by himself. We also have customers in the cable provider market where, um, they, started in a, uh, where they started the mitigation process in lowering the bandwidth. And it's really funny because they have one customer that is running, he's paying for 200 megabit um, line, but he's running on a 64 kilobit line for almost one and a half years, but hasn't fixed his problem and has for whatever reason no interest in fixing his problem, even though the bandwidth of his, uh, of his line is so small that it's, it should not be really fun to, um, 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 to surf with it. But the problem of sending millions and millions of spam messages through 64 kilobyte is also solved. So that's kind of a mitigation, a mitigation point. Remediation is if you really can solve the problem and you can get rid of the vulnerability or you can clean up the computer, you can clean up these things and make sure that everything's really, really, um, really cleaned up. So the other thing is what customers are the product, uh, what, what products are the customers on? So um, most of the companies, hosting companies, they offer several different types of products. And it also depends on how important is the product for, you, for your company. If you have, for example, a newsletter tool that's used by most of your companies or most of your, 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 your users, uh, it might be really, really um, um, important for you to fix this. Or if you run a mail relay platform or a mail server platform uh, where you end up on spam house and suddenly the um, uh, support calls spike because people can't deliver emails to their friends anymore, then suddenly this is becoming a really, really big issue for you. 
And the other, the, the third part that is really important, and that's also going back into the AUP part, in certain areas and certain countries, it's just a legal and a policy uh, issue on how can I handle customers. So, for example, I'm from Germany. In Germany, um, um, a complete block of, of ports 25 is not allowed by law because the law says if you offer internet services, you have to offer them as, as full and as complete. If you block port 25, you would not be allowed to sell it as internet access. So you can sell it as internet light or something other stupid like that, but you can't block port 25, for example. And you don't want to block port 25 in a general way anyways. But um, there are different policies depending on uh, the area you are, you're working in. And this can get really, really complicated if you're in, in, in several areas and you want to establish one abuse desk. So that's something that can be a little bit tricky and it always, uh, yeah, it always um, yeah, brings up problems um, uh, that can happen. So the process on how you, on how you uh, handle these things is something that you should build yourself depending on your customers. So for example, you can grant your customers three escalation steps. So for example, you see spam coming from your customer's computer, you see it coming in. So maybe you just send them a notice and say, hey, by the way, we have seen something coming in on the abuse desk. Please make sure to fix or to look at your computer and see if there's something weird, if something's not right. We have made the, uh, the, um, the experience with that, that 40% of the people that we have been sending these reports to or these, these notifications to have already or will solve the problem at the first step without any interaction of customer care, without any interaction of any of your company. They only get this automated templated email which says, hey, we have seen there's a problem. Please have a look at it. The speed in is, is also uh, very important. And another thing, because we, we, we think, we, we're not 100% sure, but we think that some of this has, has to do with the timeliness that these reports go out, especially in hosting companies. If somebody is running a WordPress and he's installing a, a plugin and, he, and the plugin is doing weird things and you receive reports within 10 minutes and 15 minutes later the user has his first uh, message back saying something with the WordPress is going wrong, the user knows, damn it, I have installed a plugin 15 minutes ago, maybe it's a problem with the plugin. And he knows better what he did before and being able to solve the problem. The same if you download some software or surf on some weird websites and you know, get a drive-by download. You know better where you have been the last 15, 20, 25 minutes than you know uh, six days ago on which websites you have been surfing around and uh, what plugins you have been installing on, on, on what WordPress. So that's also part about the speed and the timeliness that helps to fix uh, these problems much, much faster. But at the end of the day, what you do more or less is you more or less establish for each single piece that you're working on, copyright, spam, uh, spambertized, uh, DDoS attacks, whatever things that you have defined as a, as, as a group of things that you want to solve, you more or less define a process uh, behind that and know exactly this is how I, this is how I want to solve this problem with the customer. So maybe three escalation steps, maybe in another way it's seven escalation steps, maybe in some other things like copyright in Canada, they have an, a law that's called notice upon notice, which requires the ISP only to send and forward the report, the original report that came in to the subscriber. That's all they have to do. They don't have to handle, do anything else, they only have to forward. So that's a really, really simple process that can absolutely be automated and that is exactly the things, even if you're a small company, even if you only have a few hundred reports a day, this is stuff that can be automated and then you can get rid of um, not doing this in a manual way and looking through it and then cr uh, creating a ticket and then sending a message and then maybe get, get, get response from the customer. So these are the things, um, by building these processes, um, and as Matt said, it's really depending on, on, on how your company and how your customers are, are based and where they're based and what type of products they're using. So that's probably all sounds not too uh, abstract and not too crazy. Uh, it's process management more or less um, and, and figuring out how to, how to handle things and make, make uh, things really, um, uh, really efficient. So I mentioned at the very beginning what tooling is out there. There's, uh, there's at the moment, uh, three um, products out there um, that, can, uh, that can be used. Uh, a lot of companies still use ticketing systems. Ticketing systems can work if you're really, really small, but the problem is ticketing dis systems are not designed for abuse work. And one of the reasons is the ticketing system usually is a one-on-one -on -one 
conversation with a customer that you send an email, the customer responds, you send another email, and so on. You have a conversation going on. In the abuse world, what you want to do is the aggregation part. You receive 5,000 reports for one customer, and the ticketing system is usually not capable of aggregating these things and putting them all in one ticket. And at the end of the day, you don't want to necessarily answer to the person that sent you the report because most of the reports are automatic and nobody will respond anyway. So you want to open a ticket to send, uh, to send uh, a notification to your customer, which then can live in a ticketing system again and should also live in a ticketing system. But the abuse handling and the abuse work and the aggregation part is something that, uh, that usually ticketing systems are uh, absolutely overwhelmed, especially if you have volumes, like I said, 150, 200,000 messages a day. Uh, there's not a lot of ticketing systems out there that will be happy to take all that stuff in. So talking about ticketing, talking about abuse handling systems, there's an open source software out there which is called Abuse.io. Uh, I like a lot that they have uh, that they came up with this project. It's a uh, it's a few people, uh, it's a few people um, 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 uh, out of uh, the Netherlands, and they have a group about I would say six or seven people meanwhile that are working uh, on on a tool set. You have to install it yourself. You have to maintain itself. They don't have any automation at all. If you want to have automation, you have to wait until they build it or uh, you know they get, uh, you, you build it yourself. Um, and one of the things that they don't have is the, uh, more or less the allocation. So the aggregation part uh, is not existing in this tool set. So that's why I'm saying it's really, really good for very small volumes. Uh, it's really helpful for smaller companies. Um, works, uh, works, works really good. Um, but if you go uh, to a little bit bigger sizes um, uh, or mid-size uh, volumes, um, and Abacus can also do uh, really huge volumes uh, as, a, as a second uh, version, but um, the lack of automation in there and the lack of customer allocation uh, or the, the way and how a customer allocation works is not optimal for really, really huge volumes. Um, most of the automation part uh, has to be uh, built yourself uh, and you have to more or less work on an API base and pull data and push data back into Abacus uh, to get a little bit of automation out of the system. Um, and it's not for free. Abacus, is, uh, as far as I know, it's priced per seat depending on how many people you have sitting in your abuse desk and how many users you want to have on it, uh, it depends on, uh, that, that will um, more or less give you the price. The third product uh, is the product, and uh, I have to talk about that a little bit as well, is the product that we do, Abusix. Um, we're handling huge amounts of volumes, as I said, up to 250,000 messages a day. We have uh, report parses for over 3,000 formats. Meanwhile, um, we do all the, uh, the maintenance and no development is needed because it's more or less a software as a service uh, solution. Uh, depending on how your level of automation goes, the integration is really, really simple. Um, and um, it can be fully automated, so we have customers that run uh, pieces of their abuse desk in a 100% fully automated way with emails that get sent to the customers uh, and so on. And uh, Abuse HQ is priced on features. It depends on what type of company you are and how many, um, how many uh, features you need and what makes sense for you in your process. Good. Any questions so far? So if you don't have questions right now, feel free um, to grab me or um, I'm, I'm Matt afterwards somewhere. Uh, I'm happy to show you through some, some things or talk with you through some things if you have already kind of an idea on how you want to do things in a way, uh, but you're not sure if, this is, if it's the right way, feel free to contact us, feel free to talk to us. There's also our email addresses on. Uh, feel also free to send us an email um, so we can, uh, we can help you best uh, in establishing uh, your abuse desk. Thank you. Oh, question. Questions? May I? Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, I would like just to review a little bit one of the, 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 the pieces that you, you, you are presenting in the, the process of establishing. Yeah. When you were saying about processing and you told something about um, dealing more with the customers, so you have like 10,000 uh, complaints and uh, you deal more focused on uh, what the customer is. Please, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood what you said about that. Oh, okay. I think you are here. Yes. Uh, let me Good. just... Yeah. Yep. So... The prioritization and the decision making. No, no, it was not that. No. It was before. Was before. Yeah. This yeah. one. That's, yes. Yes. Ah, okay. That's okay. 
Okay, so what we call uh, customer and subscriber allocation means if you want to get in contact with your customer, you need to know who the customer is. Usually, the person that sends you a report does not know your customers. They only see a spam message coming in, IP address, and a timestamp. So what you need to do is more or less connect these two pieces and say, this IP address and the, at this timestamp was owned by this customer. In this case, you can you, usually a customer has a time span, a lease time, uh, maybe 24 hours, or maybe IP addresses never change, then it's pretty simple to do that. But what you want to do is you want to more or less collect all these information and all the reports that you see and collect them to one customer and maybe open a ticket or open a case or however you want to do this uh, within, within your system. That means you can more or less collect all the information, all the detail about this specific customer, and that gives you a much, much broader and better view on what's going wrong with the customer. So, for example, if somebody receives 55 complaints from AOL feedback loop, and the AOL feedback loop from a quality perspective is not really 100% good, it gives you a better view on what's that this customer maybe has sent, you know, the birthday wishes or the Christmas cards uh, at Christmas. But if you receive only maybe five reports from really, really reliable sources or maybe internal sources, and you can figure out another customer has only three complaints, but they're all coming from Spam House, you want to handle that maybe first before you handle the one of, um, of uh, the AOL complaints. But it's getting interesting if you see the AOL part and then there's every once in a while um, you know, a shadow server report in between for this single customer. And then after five or six days, suddenly a spam, report, a spam house complaint comes in. That gives you a better view on what's really going on with the customers and that gives you the, the opportunity to, to change your prioritization on the fly. But the really important part, first of all, from an aggregation perspective and second of all, from a communication perspective is this customer allocation part. And, you know, you have customers, for example, that have, uh, if you have a VPS service or if you have dedicated servers and every of your customers only gets one single IP and they can't book more of them and the single IP will always be the same and it will not change, it is really, really simple to pinpoint all the complaints that come into a single static IP address. But it can be really, really complicated like in mobile, uh, for mobile operators where the IP address is more or less changing on a per minute base depending on where they are, in which kind of zone they are, and so on and so on. So there's a full bandwidth of, of, of complexity uh, or simplicity to complexity um, on how this can look. Thank you very much. Welcome. More any, questions? Anyone any other questions? Somebody? No, he's not going to the microphone. Okay, perfect. Then. Okay, so, uh, so yes, I, I did want to take a moment to uh, uh, point out uh, both, uh, both Lucy Mara and Christian. You can stand up and wave to the crowd. Uh, so um, the, the, the big reason why we came here to do this, uh, do this presentation uh, was to strengthen the, the bond between MOG and the LACNIC, LACNOG uh, community. And uh, both uh, both Lucy Mara and Christian are are chairing the anti abuse working group within uh, within LACNIC. I think they're calling it uh, LAC AAWG, and uh, we're you know we're going to be working closely together and ensuring that we're getting the information that we need to you and also in turn back to us, so we're able to collaborate together and build these best practices documents, make sure that we communicate uh, what the issues are that, that are happening so we can solve these problems together. Because at the end of the day, none of us can do this on our own. Uh, it's great to think that maybe you can, but uh, I've, just, I've, I've never been able to, to see myself being able to solve some of the problems that I've had at Rackspace without attending MOG and understanding these are some of the problems that people are having and don't feel like you're alone in some of the issues that you have. Uh, the, the, the biggest lie that I hear from, from anybody who, uh, who I talk to when I'm talking about abuse is saying, we don't have abuse problems. Come on, everybody has abuse problems in some form, fa fashion, or manner. So uh, I, I do encourage you to get in touch with Lucy Mara and, and Christian 
And they're also going to be working with us with this training that we've given today. We're going to modify that and make it applicable more to, to, the, to the Latin American community. Uh, and she's going to go ahead and grab a microphone, but we're going to try and make this, you know, something that we can do as an ongoing and evolving process. Yes, Lucy. Yes, I would like to ask you, uh, everybody that was here uh, attending this training, if you can, uh, I'm not sure if we are going, if it, there is a, a feedback form, something online. So if you can send us uh, some feedback uh, on what you think, uh, if we cover the topics that are, are important to you, what we could make it better. So if you can send us feedback, it would be very, very valuable to us and so that we can uh, improve and also uh, for, for future, future activities so that we can plan in better what we are going, we are going to make. So um, as Matt was saying, uh, this is a relationship that we, we started some, uh, like weeks ago, and we we are planning things for to, to come, and uh, we we are going. We, we like would like to really uh, reach uh, the, the the point of treating abuse uh, on the community. So uh, I'm not sure if he, everybody here uh, saw the 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 starting of the lucky AWG group. So uh, this group it's meant to be uh, a community. But not, not creating a new community, but engage people in different communities in like, like Nick, like Nog, the operators, and, and, and helping the, the idea of treating abuse and uh, creating best practices and uh, creating awareness on the best practices need in the community, in the, the, the region. So please come and participate and helping us uh, to make this, this thing going forward. Christian? Yes, I'm going to say it in English, so take off your headphones. Sorry, it's go I'm going to announce the ball. No, no problem. Okay. Yeah. Eh, en español, pueden sacarse los auriculares. Eh, esto no es un, una nueva lista de correo, una nueva comunidad. Las comunidades ya existen. Lo que queremos hacer es tratar de ayudar a los operadores a implementar cosas, a conocer herramientas que tienen los CERTs, a los que conocen de DNS... Eh, enterarse de amenazas o enterarse de documentos de mejores prácticas o implementaciones. Ahora vemos que falta esa, esa conexión entre grupos de expertos que ya existen. Y eso es lo que vamos a tratar de hacer. Entonces, este es un grupo de unos pocos trabajadores. O, eh, no, no, no. Es un grupo de trabajo de pequeñas personas conectando grupos que ya existen que es donde están los expertos. Entonces, lo que queremos ver es, primero, cuáles son esas áreas urgentes que ustedes necesitan, especialmente los, los operadores o los que necesitan implementar cosas o ayuda para defenderse de estos casos de, de abuso de red, y eh, poner a disposición herramientas y documentos que existen para que se enteren de, de mejores prácticas o, o de herramientas. A veces hay herramientas open source disponibles que nos pueden ayudar muchísimo. Entonces, para discutir un poco más, pueden hacer preguntas ahora, pero también estamos organizando un BOF mañana. BOF son estas reuniones informales donde cualquiera puede preguntar, proponer y, y pedir. Eh, será mañana a las 6 de la tarde, lo van a ver en la agenda como BOF. El BOF va a tener dos temas, un, una, parte con, una parte que va a ser esta, donde vamos a, a invitar a que propongan temas para que nosotros trabajemos, y otra parte que va a ser de, de mediciones de internet que no tiene nada que ver con esto pero están invitados mañana a las 6 de la tarde. Claro, un, una cosa más que se necesita es en esas recomendaciones global que están escritas, tener la problemática de nuestra región. Como ejemplo, el, el Guanacray que ocurrió hace un par de semanas. Una recomendación es actualizar todos los sistemas operativos. Es un pecado, un error no actualizar los sistemas operativos. Bueno, la realidad es que muchas empresas de nuestra región no pueden actualizar los sistemas operativos porque no los tienen legales, porque son viejos, por un montón de razones. No puede ser nuestra recomendación tener legales los sistemas operativos. No es problema nuestro por qué ellos no lo tienen. Es un hecho. Contra ese hecho... 
nosotros tenemos que tener alguna recomendación que evite estos problemas. Entonces, eso es un, uno de los ejemplos donde cosas que son recomendaciones globales y verdades absolutas de todo el mundo, bueno, en nuestra región no, no, no funcionan. Entonces, hay cosas que nosotros tenemos que subir a los documentos de mejores prácticas porque nuestra realidad puede ser diferente a la del primer mundo donde se escriben las cosas. Necesitamos voluntarios para mostrarnos esas cosas donde el documento que ustedes leen está muy lindo en la teoría, pero en la práctica y no aplica tal como está escrito. And another thing that we need volunteers is also for this, for the best practice, uh, okay. we are going to, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they, they, they were not, I think they will understand better my English than my Portuguese. <laughs> And um, um, there are also, as, as Christian told you, there were some needs from the lucky region that we would like to cover better. So, uh, We need volunteers to help us writing documents and also writing uh, things, little things that can help be sending the message forward. So if you have a blog in a company, if you have a, a mailing list inside your company that, and you would like to uh, create an awareness inside your company, we need volunteers to be in contact with us and also It's starting to spread in the message all over. It's not only uh, helping creating documents, but also pu pushing the, the, the message forward. So uh, I hope you, you guys come and participate tomorrow at the both at 6 p.m. And um, I think we need to go back. Huh? Sí, preguntas. Pueden preguntar en español, en portugués. Falar um pouco em português, então pode manter os, os fones. <risos> uh, a, forma de... a forma de participação no grupo ante abuso da América Latina, quais são os principais meios de participação e é necessário declarar interesse? Se isso é respondido amanhã no BOF, só para saber de uma maneira mais prática. Eu estou interessado. Qual é o próximo passo? Há um site no LACNIC, uma lista de e-mail, converso contigo. Como... Quantos falam português aqui? Quantos falam espanhol? Eu vou falar devagarzinho, então. Não vai ser um grupo novo para colaborar. Esse grupo já existe. Então, se o seu interesse nessas questões de, de CERT, o que é CERT, ou quem que pode ajudar com o CERT ou não, existe um grupo na América Latina e no Caribe de CERT. Laxi CERT, e Paula. Cadê Paula? Onde está? especialista em certs, a Lucimara também. Então, podem colaborar com essa comunidade. E tem um documento que já foi pedido uh, segunda-feira pelos certs que que é necessidade como fazer uma boa comunicação entre os certs e os operadores. E uma forma de colaborar seria, seria colaborar com o seu documento. Os documentos de melhores práticas podem ser desenvolvidos em um grupo da LACNOV e de BICOPSIS, Blast Ground Operation Corps, que é uma sigla em inglês. Esses grupos servem para imprimir novos documentos, são documentos conjuntos com os certs. Então, a forma de participar é, é participando em, nos lugares onde, onde se atua. Tem um grupo de Enense relacionado com Enense, e esse grupo já existe. Podem pedir coisas para nós, que eles podem ver como os problemas, e nós vemos como os... Nós já vemos a partir de... Já vemos como que as comunidades que existem já podem ajudar. Podemos conectar com o MOG, por exemplo, que é um grupo global, porque alguns dos documentos não aplicam e há que modificar ou necessitam novos documentos, então aí se pode inteirar. O nosso papel pode ser... O, faz... o nosso papel é facilitar o trabalho de vocês, conectar vocês com um grupo que pode resolver o problema. 
Não sei se ficou claro, se vocês entenderam. Alguma outra pergunta? Sim. Essas são as listas de e-mail onde nós vamos começar com as pessoas interessadas. É o WebCop, que foi as Bicops do Christian, são os da região que serão discutidas. Que é da lista de LACNOC, que são os operadores em geral. Que LACSEC, que são da área de segurança. Que aí vamos usar pessoas. Precisamos de pessoas, a Exis, também que é uma lista certa. Então, essa é só para pessoas que queiram trabalhar no assunto que esteja, que faça um bate de um centro de respostas. Então, esse é um time que esteja, que, que, que queira trabalhar com excedentes, com informação, que possa participar. Mas para aqueles que querem se envolver no desenvolvimento de helicóptero, ajudar a escrever novas práticas novas, ou que sejam também a tradução de alguma prática que existe e que precisam que seja boa em outra, no idioma local, por exemplo, então que possam se inscrever na LICOP. Se vocês não sabem, vocês podem me enviar um e-mail caso não saibam como se inscrever. Eu vou mandar, um, eu vou mandar uma URL para que vocês possam se inscrever aí na lista. Obrigado. Oi, eu sou o Matias Megoni e a parte da apresentação é que, bem, talvez, na parte que eles estavam falando, que o que nós podemos fazer não é ativo, é por solução. Tem, muito, tem muita gente que desconhece informática, que, o que é um provedor, o que é um usuário, que, que não vende... Uh, as, ou que não vende, só distribui, e que tem muito pouco conhecimento de, dessa parte, das poucas coisas na questão de segurança. E aí se vê alguma forma, alguma entidade que pode dar um, um, um texto de apresentação gratuito, e talvez seria interessante as pessoas que queiram se utilizar dessas organizações, e isso poderia ajudar na questão da segurança. E isso daria muito apoio para a pessoa que não tem o conhecimento e as que já tem, ou, e, ou então saber que isso já existe. Eu vou translate that, that question. Because, yes, because uh, he said that the, the presentation was regarding things that, that, are, are, that take place after the incident, so some, how they are reactive. So, and there's a need for at least in our region, for more tools that can prevent things instead of react to things. Actually, both are necessary, but we have like a lack of uh, implementations or experience or something on tools to prevent. So what advices come from more or, or what uh, resources are available to prevent? Okay, well, uh, prevention is, it's, it's multi-stage. Multi so the, the very first thing that you want to look at when you're, when you're thinking about prevention is stopping them from getting into your network at all. So that comes in the, in the case of vetting uh, customers that are coming into your environments. When you find out that a a fraudulent customer or a uh, malicious customer, which is basically somebody who's going to pay their bill every month. They're very happy to pay you the small amount that they're going to pay to be able to send out all of the abuse that they can to make all much more money. So being able to have a solid uh, vetting process to understand uh, what, a, uh, what a malicious party looks like One thing that, uh, that I always try and make sure that people try and focus on is figure out what a good, regular customer looks like and then 
anything that's outside of that is an outlier, is somebody that you need to keep an eye on, and somebody that you need to put pieces in place uh, on your on your in inbound uh, of bringing in a new customer. You need to make sure that you have you keep records of when you have a bad user that comes on. Where did they come from? What did they say uh, when, let's, let's say it's with somebody who went through a sales team, what did they say to the sales team? How did they describe what their, uh, what their product was? And being able to have as many walls in place to stop, stop those from coming in, and you'll, you'll, prevent, uh, you'll prevent yourself from making it so hard for good customers to want to get in because they're not going to be the ones that are going to be saying some of the things or doing some of the things that some of the malicious people are doing. Uh, one, one piece that we figured out when we were having an issue with fraud in our, in our cloud was, I, I mean, when we first spun up our, uh, our cloud business, we had tons of fraud. It was an everyday battle. We were getting thousands of IPs blacklisted every week, and it was just a non-ending thing. Uh, and it's just because we didn't have anything in place to, to vet. And the, the piece that we, that we came to was, A, look at their usage. Uh, and that's something, if you're going to be billing somebody by usage, you're going to be able to see what the usage is. Uh, in addition, where are they coming from? Uh, and that was those were a few things that we were able to do. Also, a uh, a reauthorization of a of a credit card. Once you once you have them for a couple of days, you just you do the the little check to see if uh, if it's if it's reauthorized. Does the card pass reauthorization? And also, did they change the credit card right after they signed up? Those are just some indicators that, that you can use. Uh, you can also use that on the side of, uh, of a malicious party that's already in your environment uh, or somebody who has been taken over and they've been compromised. Just look at the usage. Where are they coming from? What are they doing? Were they in, uh, were they in Brazil and now all of a the sudden they're in Russia? Uh, trying to trying to log into the account and send things out. So there's you know there's there's a thing that we've talked about which is the uh, the Santa Claus rule. So uh, are they all of a sudden in Brazil and then they're in Texas and then they're in Canada and they're in Japan within the set within the span of a few minutes? Nobody's going that fast, uh, and they're they're not able to make those jumps. So. It, there's there are things out there, and these these are some of the things that are mentioned in the uh, in the best practices documents. A couple of uh, couple of pointers, and a lot of it is high level. Uh, it doesn't really boil down into some of the specifics, but it's a place for you to get started, and you're able to you know just build and piece in as you as you move down the line. I would like to complete a little bit the question about uh, how to prevent incidents. Uh, it was incidents that you mentioned. So adopting best practice, it's yeah. one of the measures that can help preventing things. Uh, so it's a very known best practice like BCP38. So that's what, what's for. If you have BCP38 in your environment implemented, you are contributed to Reduce the number of uh, of uh, um, the, the, the denial of service attacks. You can you are not allowing um, traffic that it's not legitimate in your network. If he, people had implemented the best practice of uh, applying patches, maybe they want to cry had another reach it that much that it, so. Adopting best practice is one, is one way of uh, uh, not completely prevent, but helping to prevent uh, uh, things from, from happening. And this is one of the, the reasons that we wanted to push uh, more BCPs and best practices uh, forward, uh, one of the, the things. And also, uh, as, as Tobias mentioned, uh, that um, you have to be quick, you have to be fast. So. Uh, Working on the detection 
it's very important. As fast as you detect, the faster you're going to react, and that makes a lot of difference. So if you can, if you don't know, if you don't know that something is happening in your network, you cannot react to that. There was some research some time ago. I don't remember the name of the organization that was pushing this this research. That like a seven ninety to seventy percent of the organizations just realized they have been invaded or something like that because they received a complaint from someone outside. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you, if you don't detect, if you're not able to detect, you will not be able to react, and the impact in your network will be much, much worse. Yeah, um, one, one point from my side as well, and this is exactly when we're talking about, still about the outbound and um, reducing the amount of tickets or the amount of compromises that you have within your network. Of course, you can have a look at and say, 80% of the compromises or 80% of the problems I have in the abuse desk is coming from a really, really bad vetting process at the beginning. And then of course you go and say, let's look at the vetting process and make sure that not 80%, that's maybe only 10% left. Um, and then going, going down the road and doing these measures and uh, improving your infrastructure and improving the sign-up process and improving the credit card billing in, uh, system and integrating other departments with each other. But the easiest and the cheapest way, and it's what we have seen for a long, long time, is to really handle the abuse mailbox and to see what kind of comp complaints are coming in because you can you can go out there and you know pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for security products and most of you probably do all do that already but you will never be sure that you really cover everything that, that that's really important for you and the other the other step on that is the bad guys they will adjust and they will adopt if you make the vetting process harder they try to get in even even harder for a certain time period, or or they try to find other uh, other security holes. But you don't want to you don't want to uh, more or less close a security hole that is not creating any problem for you. Let the bad guys figure it out. Let the bad guys use it, and then figure it out on how you can solve it at that point. So if you it's it, that's kind of the proactive. If you fast within that, then it's still better than trying to you know throw um, 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 dollars at every single hole that you can more or less fill, uh, even if it's not really a problem. And just reinforcing, please have an abuse desk. I mean, thinking of treating abuse and receiving the, the complaints. We, I, I'm particularly I'm part of a computer emergency response team a national computer emergency response team, and we receive complaints from all around the world about the, the, our network, the network that, that is a, a, our cons constituents. And, uh, and that up that sometimes we, we cannot reach the, 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 the organization that is being affected, that's generating some, some uh, of the, the problems because they don't have a, an abuse or something to, to deal with that. So it's important that you you establish a channel to to deal with uh, with abuse. This is my first LACNIC, and I think this is the first time that it's, uh, a, a abuse uh, activity happening. Uh, like I really enjoy this training. And uh, I would like to suggest for maybe for the next LACNIC, open space to uh, maybe ISP or a hosting company to share a study case from a good pra uh, a practice in anti-abuse. Maybe, I don't know, op just open space for someone in the community to share. Uh, I think it's a good way to encourage more people to have abusive practice. And by doing this, maybe people will say, oh, uh, things like this happen, and things like and when this is happening, uh, I get a a better uh, coverage and a better interaction with the community. So maybe a, a suggestion from the next uh, lack of meeting. <laughs> Otra pregunta. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
how do you generate a um, user policy when you are a big service provider and you have customers worldwide? Each customer has its own uh, law in his country. And if it's possible, is there any kind of standardization initiative happening now? That's, that's a very good question, and that's exactly what I mentioned before. You have different legal uh, you know, environments. That makes it really, really hard. I, I'm not aware of, or I'm aware of that in, in, in Europe, for example, there's kind of a harmonization going on in that direction, but it's still, to be honest, it's not there yet, and I don't see it to be there yet uh, pretty soon. Um, in the United States, I don't know how it's in, in, in South, America, South America, Middle America, or in Asia. I think it's not not better there. Um, so, to be honest, the only the only answer I can give to that is really to maybe find the smallest common denominator and start with that, and figure out that maybe having or contacting a customer, uh, which should be allowed in every environment, um, might already help. I think also when we're talking about termination or terminating customers or when we're um, blocking customers or locking customers, I would say locking customers and blocking customers is happening on an ongoing basis, but a termination of a customer is nothing that you do on a daily basis. At least that's what I hope. So uh, a termination of a customer is something that maybe, I don't know, Matt, do you have numbers or can you share numbers? How often do you terminate a customer on a monthly basis? From an abuse perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> and if you don't have, to, if you don't, if you can't answer, but, but are we are we in the tenth? Are we in the hundreds? Are we in the thousand? <laughs> Sorry for calling. Okay. Me well, no, 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 no. Uh, so. Um, on a, how often do we, how often do we end up terminating a customer who is a customer? What I mean by that is a customer is somebody who has signed up for your signed up for your business, is who they say they are, and whatnot. Now, we're not going to talk about fraud because that's when you know that's that's why I was sitting there being like, how do I answer this? So. Uh, in terms of the actual customer that uh, that we end up uh, uh, severing the relationship with, it's relatively low. Uh, I would say that it's maybe not even two digits a month uh, that we uh, that we end up uh, getting rid of somebody because of abuse. Uh, most of the time, it's maybe even like two or three, uh, and that's. That's even more of an outlier. I mean, some months we don't terminate anybody, uh, and in most of the in in that's not including fraud. Uh, when you look at fraud, that's a whole different beast. That's up in the that's up in the hundreds, and uh, usually those those customers are not even there for 24 hours, and they just get you know they get past our 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 process and are just able to get in. We get a single complaint, or we do uh, some of our checking with their usage, or we reauthorize the card and it fails. That type of thing that I was already talking about. Uh, but for the for the regular customer, and I think it's more because of how we get right on top of of uh, a customer's issue, contact them, reach out to them, give them all of the stuff that we can to help them remediate so it doesn't happen again. That's the reason why we don't really run into having to terminate a lot of customers out of our environment. And if you look at it from how many segments that we have at Rackspace, uh, on our dedicated side, we may, uh, and this is the physical actual server, we may terminate one a year. Uh, and that's because those are the guys that are paying a lot of money and paying a lot for support and also have more knowledge in what's happening. Where you have a little bit more on the termination side is on the cloud and 
the, there's, there's some reasoning to that because A, with the cloud, we could go and grab somebody off of the street right now, get them signed up with a, with a cloud account and have them spin up a server with a lovely WordPress site that's going to get compromised in two minutes. And they usually don't have the expertise and the, the resources that somebody who's on our dedicated side, so they, uh, don't, they don't have the appreciation of the knowledge sometimes. And that's where you have to, you have to really focus on the education and, uh, and make sure that you're not getting to the point where you are terminating 20 customers a week because they either don't know how to solve the problem, won't solve the problem, or can't solve the problem. And giving them as many resources as possible. So it's kind of a nebulous answer, I know, uh, but... It's it's the lo it's low numbers that uh, that we end up terminating. It's really on that fraud side where you're getting a lot of lot of bad customers uh, on on that side. One thing that I would say to note is when you do terminate a customer, definitely keep note of it and make sure that it's shared across all of your segments. We've had times where we've ended up terminating a customer in email, and they sign up a week they, they would sign up a week later on our cloud doing the same thing that they were doing on the email, just using their own server to uh, pollute the environment. Uh, and, you know, that's a, always keep track of, uh, of that thing, of, of that type of thing. And it's only just notes about who they are. Uh, and, you know, it, it be careful in your, in your data retention. I don't know what your laws are for, uh, for keeping that type of information, but some type of identifier is a uh, is a good thing to keep as long as it's within your your legal uh, legal framework. So, yes. So I want to add to this because I'm not sure if we're answering the question. Yeah, I was so, I was I was just going to say one thing. I think having an AUP that's globally acceptable for all your customers, and then handling the things that are really tricky and different from a different legal or in different legal environments like a termination, on a manual base and on a case to case right. base depending on how many customers you have and how many customers you plan to terminate, would probably be the best answer that I can come up with right now. So. I think that's perfect, actually. And that's what I wanted, and I'm glad you said that, because, yeah, from a global perspective, having a global AUP, even though you have multiple websites that are based on the country that you're doing business in, having that AUP be about, I don't know, 80 90% global, and then having a very small section of it that says, by the way, the business or the things that you do will also be, if the laws, the laws where you are living or that you're doing business will be applicable because there are different laws in different areas. So, Stip, uh, sorry, Stip, uh, Tobias is, is right that about 80 to 90 percent of it can be a global AUP, but then if you have your attorneys, your barristers and whatnot put in that language, that usually will cover you. So thank you for being here. Muito obrigada por por virem. Gracias por estar estarem acá. Gracias a todos ellos.